Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thanks to Mark Ashton and the Australasian Journal of Plastic Surgery, this how to do it section is something that he's initiated and it also has applications on getting over problems with stylized techniques which are always written to date but often they're misinterpreted in the outcome. I have used my experience in handling mallet deformities to complicated cases and show how simple it can using a Del Boutonnier style and give you results which in the patient's perspective is quite satisfactory. And in the Crawford classification, the results are excellent. They're the two important items. The technique consists of this. I've applied it to two cases, and these are representative cases. The first one is that of a traumatic injury involving over 50% of the articular surface. And the second case is a chronic mallet injury management after eight months and represents total failure. And if you've got a failure after that length of time and you've got that amount of articular, these are just representative samples where patients and their opinion are voicing over and saying what they think of this uh, Boutonnier type style of reduction. Now, why is it called this? That's just incidental. But it is the Boutonnier elastic glass splint technique. And strangely enough, the acronym seems to spill up into a nice terminology. But that's presumptuous to say it is the best. In my opinion, in my hands, it is successful. There is no element of any questionable outcome because other questionable outcomes do occur with the feral stack technique and every emergency department has these. The patient comes to our patients, they complain of pain, discomfort and disturbance. The second thing is, John Houston taught me, and I've adopted it for the early part of my career, that over one third of the articular surface is, uh, is fractured, it warrants an open reduction. But having got that experience, I've developed into this other technique of the Boutonnier style, and I've used, would you believe it, basing ideas on the old Bally and Love textbook, which I had in my student days. But look, there's the Boutonnier position. Yes, that is what I'm doing, nothing new. But look at how they maintain it. They use a plaster cylinder, stick it in water, hold it there. And we know a plaster happens in a week, it deteriorates. And this is what Bally and Love says in the 1970s. There's much dissatisfaction of the surgeon and the patient alike from the point of view of failure to correct the deformity. And this is an ongoing flexion and distal thing which the patients find so dissatisfying. This is the simple technique. It is just a strip of elastoplast, 15 centimetres, with the middle third divided into two collateral slips, which slip over the PIPJ and are firmly attached to either side at the line of the collateral ligaments. The pulp is hyperextended using the pulse of grip there, and the elastoplast is turned around the distal nail area, stuck back onto the palm, and firmly applied. So that's point one, point two. Now the unattached end on the metacarpal, in this case, metacarpal three, is pulled tight, maximizing the hyperextension there by collateral bands and hyperflexing the PIPJ. This uh, technique that can be repeated on either side, but we have a three layered and three week repetition style. There's another view of the same collateral ligaments in position. There's a hyperextension. There's the firm applications on the dorsal surface of the metacarpal. And there is the layer two, which is one and two, maintains the position of the reduction. And if it's maintained in that position, it still can flax out in the looseness there and go into a non-maintained hard position. And the met metacarpal tension pull may loosen. Therefore, we do a third layer, which stabilizes the reduction. So you can see one layer, two layer, and three layer elastoplasts there, one, two, three. And that locks in position, but is checked every week by me, the surgeon, to see if it's maintained. There is this, there is his problem. Uh, that's, that's, it's not an over 50% fragment. I didn't measure at the time, but it was certainly over two thirds of the articular surface from a football injury in a 21 year old soccer player. Now there is his initial management. Now, sometimes this reduction position does cause pain. And therefore I do these under Marcane local anesthetic with a digital block and that lasts 24 hours. 
and that that patient is there comfortable and he'll give his own verbal confirmation of how it uh, felt during that early phase. You can see the position, you can see the maintenance, and that's at the initial cause of the treatment. One week later, look what's happening at one week. The elastoplast is loosening. He must have washed his hands. I've no idea what he did. Look at the extension creeping into the PIPJ. It needs to be locked into itself there to so soften the collateral ligament. So the extensor attachment of the insertion at the, uh, the uh, distal phalanx there can be maintained in good alignment. But looking at the position, there is some improvement in the mallet arrangement even after a week. There's the articular fragment. Fairly large, fairly thin, and it seems to be dorsally displaced. I can't explain why it has that X-ray appearance. That seems to be a hole. But if if this maintenance in position and the joint reforms itself with callus formation, that must that come and you'll see the subsequent X-rays that reshapes itself into the normality. Now here's a video of the patient's expression of what he experienced in that first week of that episode. Anthony, what do you think of the procedures now, a week old for your mallet injury? Well, at first, I thought it was a little bit uh, just unorthodox for mine. However, I must say, um, just a few days after, I felt almost no pain at all. And it just seems to be I'm um, actually improving over time. And now that it's the week after my um, first procedure, um, I've had uh, Mr. B in here operate on it again. And it's, well, basically, him touching it has caused me almost no pain. So I would say it's definitely I'm looking good. Now there is the x-ray, there's a slight change, but in the size of that displaced volume and something must be happening in callus formation to allow that to slip into that area as you'll see subsequently. This is the two week x-ray appearance. Again, the two week x-ray appearance, I mean, um, a clinical appearance. Look at the looseness of the elastoplast. Look at the fragmentation that's gone on. The areas are detached proximally, Look at the extension slips around the PIPJ. They've gone back into neutral, almost into a straight alignment, yet we've maintained the mallet shape right to the end there. But the irregularity and the displacement of the small fibres there indicate that needs reattachment and refashioning. However, two weeks, there is functional improvement. The patient does feel comfortable. He can flex the digit now, and we'll be able to reapply the elastoplast technique. There is at four weeks, having had now three weeks of thing, this is the four week appearance, almost back to normal. There is a full flexion barring the middle finger, which is almost at the distal palm of crease. The X-ray is suddenly realigning back to normal. I don't know what's happening to that joint there, but it's approaching normal in appearance. Four week video. appearance there's realignment notice the approximation of the callus now over the articular surface that has gone from about a two or three millimeter gap almost to a one millimeter gap there and that will come back to normal at six weeks let's see what the patient has he now can flex to the distal palm of crease there's a normal external appearance and his own verbal confirmation of um, the outcome Okay, so tell me about your hand. How long ago it was injury? Six weeks. Yeah, it was fully about fully six extended, weeks ago. laying on your trousers there. Turn around to show the full range of movement, flexion to show the clutch lines of the distal palm crease. And what is your experience of this operation? Experience? Well, at the start, I thought it was a little unorthodox with the best technique that was used. The best end for Boutonnier, the Elastoplast uh, split technique. Yes. Yeah. And? As a result of now four weeks without a K1, without an operation, you've got almost a full functional range of food. Yeah, which is quite impressive. I really didn't expect to um, have this so quickly, I must say. And the final point is, have you had any pain? 
No, no, I really have not. I did have a conventional splint on previously, which just caused me more pain. It didn't really seem to be improving anything. And I must say, after the initial pain of the best technique, it actually got this rather painless for the remaining four weeks. Yeah. So now, three and a half months, continued to improve, repetition of the same, and he fulfills the criteria of the key outcomes. That is, that there is in location of the joint, there's pain is zero, and there's no extensor lag. That's more what you want. And using those Crawford classifications, and therefore it could be described presumptively here in this case as excellent, but I could no doubt it's back to normal. Three and a half months, repetition of the same yeah. story again. And there's the x ray appearance. Now look at the articular realignment. That big dollop seems to have faded into merging healing units. The callus formation is reconstituted there. Can you do that surgically? No, you can do it by the simple technique and improve it back to normal. And sometimes I use an orthoplast splint for the daylight hours when they're sleeping, when they're, when they're not sort of normal and they want to have some little protective splint, but it's not a necessary outcome or necessity. Now, before I go on to case two, I would just like to state that the outcome of the location of the joint, the pain-free and the global movement in a fracture produces that result. Now, let me show you what can be done when you have failed conservative management. This cleaning lady cleaning the carpet, damaged and felt the splint go bang and the extensor mallet of curls occurred because she ruptured the attachment and she had eight months of what they call the feral stack splints. Those little insufferable, painful little units that are in every emergency department that go on the end. The patient finds them uncomfortable. They find the pressure effect disturbing. The person who puts it on hasn't got the experience or whatever it is, the patient does not like this stack feral splint technique. She had this patient had eight months subsequently through hand therapy departments of umpteen splints made, all unsuccessful. Why all unsuccessful? Well, there's her appearance after eight months. Hence, we do our little technique. There is the strip. There is the collateral bands. A couple of the pair of scissors stripping over the side of the PIPJ. And as I said earlier, there are the two bands that sit in either position there. The patient's hyperextending the pulp with difficulty. And you see it's not coming out as easily earlier. However, we stick that onto the pulp surface. We put the collateral bands on either side of the PIPJ and the loose reins of the, of, the, of the strapping are pulled tight over metacarpal three in this case to reinforce the area of change. Now level, doing that on one a level of elastoplast is unsuccessful. Level two, you need the more security, but level three gives you the maintenance of the reduction. And there it is there in position as the patient was. I'd like to bring to your attention how the edema of the hand is starting to resolve and the patients now can get her rings back on the hand, let alone the other way around. And there's the three layer technique again, one, two, three, you can see it there and it's maintained it and that the extension creeping into the DIPJ of that digit. See, therefore we have the layer one creates the reduction, layer two maintains the reduction and layer three stabilizes it. Uh, now at 15 days, the patient said, she's pain free for the first time in eight months. Why is it pain free? I've no idea. Note that she can get her other rings on. There's some little emotional aspect there of wearing her rings. Every person who's got injury who wears rings likes to get the rings back on. The maladeformity is almost resolved and the edema is settling. And that's only after 15 days, not eight months. A repeat splint, repeated. Weekly, I change these from my, in my rooms there on a weekly basis over that four week period or over a three-week period, and we got the outcome that we have achieved in this case. At six weeks, the maintenance is there. It's almost approaching normal. The edema has gone out of the hands. The extension of the distal phalanx is noted, and there's no great area of restriction from the point of view of pain. At six months, the patient feels back to normal. 
full extension and the proximal into the proximal palm crease. And secondly, the idea of pain has disappeared and the end location of the distal phalanx over that joint there is, is, is appropriately documented. A lateral view at six months, same again. Note, they talk about the end location of the distal phalanx, no pain and the joint position with no lag. They're the three criteria that Crawford uses in his overall summary. Now, the, video, the best outcome is ask the patient what she experienced, and I'll let the video do the talking in this case here. What's your experiences? What did you think of it? Um, well, I thought it was absolutely amazing, you know, that, that a simple elastoplast and the way you hyperextended my finger and, and that it uh, fixed it up, you know, within two weeks. And what was your expression? Say, at eight days, you felt different. Um, at eight days, it was uh, absolutely ma amazing, marvellous. After, after eight months' surgery? Yes, yeah. Um, or eight, eight months of... of uh, I think of, of, yeah. of, of injury. Of injury. Waiting for possible surgery. Yes, yes. And the third point is, this, so when you finally got function, what was your impression regarding the function? Well, the function was absolutely perfect and it's better than the other. It's better than the other one. I can actually bend it further than the other one. Why so, is that? Is there any arthritic changes? I have no idea. No, and, no. And any pain? When did the pain disappear? The, well, the pain would have disappeared probably in those first two weeks. Exactly right. Yeah. Anyway, and the final point is, would you have the procedure done again? I would absolutely have the procedure done again. And I don't think um, the hospital was happy when they rang me to to give me the surgery. And I told them it was fixed and they were flabbergasted. They said, oh, how could it be fixed? And I said, well, um, a, a person did it with a butcher. Yeah. And they said, oh, that hasn't been used for ages. Good on you. And you, you, you knew the words and that's how marvellous it was. experiences now i think it's relevant to put some pertinent articles in synoptic form that are in the current literature and they're all referenced at the bay at the, at the, the back of the word document but hussein et al talks about the outcomes with large articular fragments and gives the experience from the unit and you can read the summary of it but this best technique overcomes all those problems by something so simple Wade et al. stipulates that the large articular fragments are insufficient support to treat surgically or conservatively. He goes and looks at the balance of his arguments again. Weaver and Schneider discuss a whole range of articular deformities in relation to fractures, type A, type B, type C, and all the rest of it. I don't even go into classifications on these. I treat them all the same way. Salazar goes on, discusses the adverse outcomes from surgical intervention. And you need no elaboration. We've all had the infected K wire. We've all had the bloody outcomes that are, that, are full, that are swollen and the patients find the dissatisfaction, let alone the repeat theater admissions. Handel discusses the splintage varieties, but the patient compliance the first time that's come into it. If you, as a surgeon, do the manipulation of this plaster, you've got continuity there, where if it's delegated to an outside source, I think the compliance of the patient becomes diluted. Tolkien discusses the lack of consensus in the management of malignant and a universal point of view, whereas the best technique universalizes all the methods that can be used into one simple elastoplast splint technique and look at the pain relief. Kangadal discusses the 41% surgical complication rate in the management of mallets. The only complication rate in this case is that it becomes too loose and therefore ineffective. And then unit, I'll discuss the articular fragments over one third, and there's no difference between extensive block pinning and conservative spinach. Who wants to have another operation with extension block pinning? And finally, Savage, which is a good article from New Zealand, discusses the criteria for successful management and puts a firm case in for type 2B needs a fracture and therefore open intervention, whereas 1B can be conservatively managed. I don't have to worry about that with the best technique. It applies to them all. And so in summary, then, we can achieve outcomes from mallets with joint end location, pain-free score of zero, no extensive lag, patient satisfied, and in the Crawford classification of outcomes, it fulfills the excellent criteria. Thank you.